Good morning, and welcome to the Winter Services Innovation Session as part of PennDOT's first ever virtual Innovation Week. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Danielle Klinger Grumbine with PennDOT's Bureau of Innovations, and I will be your host for today's session. I'd like to kick things off today with a welcome message from PennDOT Deputy Secretary for Planning, Larry Shiflett. Good morning and welcome back to our Virtual Innovations Week. I'm Larry Shifflett, PennDOT's Deputy Secretary for Planning. Today's sessions deal with the heart of our work, winter services and equipment. But these sessions will reflect my area of interest, timely and effective planning. Taking the steps to ensure your equipment is ready and well deployed represents the best of planning. We will be sharing details on winter fleet preparation, anti-icing best practices, dump truck specifications and innovations, and how our maintenance forces have coped with the COVID-19 challenges. People on the PennDOT team across the state rose to meet and exceed expectations during this difficult time, and we are grateful for their dedication. We in the planning area also have embraced the technological advances in such areas as mapping and GIS capabilities. The goal was to share more and more information with the public and further our commitment to PennDOT Connects which is our ongoing strategy to embrace local concerns and needs into whatever we do. This involves better coordination with planning organizations across the state and more engagement through social media and virtual meeting formats. These steps helped us to successfully complete the most recent update to the 12 year program this year. Innovation also plays an important role as we all struggle to maintain and enhance Pennsylvania's large and diverse transportation network with limited resources. The more efficient we become, the more people trust that we are making the best use of taxpayers' resources. We hope this Virtual Innovations Week provides some insights into our operations that will help you with the challenges you each face every day. Our efforts this week reflect our commitment to effectively partner with each of you and deliver even more transportation benefits to the people of Pennsylvania. Again, thank you for your participation. Have a great day and enjoy the sessions. So following each presentation today, uh, there will be a facilitated question and answer period. If you have any questions for our speakers during today's session, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen to submit your questions. We will be taking questions in the order in which they were received. Throughout the Virtual Innovation Week, I also encourage you to view the more than 50 innovative tools, materials, applications, and technologies on display in our virtual exhibit hall. That is located on our event website, www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. These innovations are being used by federal, state, and local agencies and could help you do your job safer, better, faster, and save money. There is also a contact form on the virtual exhibit hall page that will allow you to submit any questions that you have about a particular innovation. So again, that website for the virtual exhibit hall is www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. And finally, before I introduce our first speakers, please be advised that this session is being recorded. Recordings of this session will be available on our event website within the next week or so. Further, you can also click on the participation link in the calendar invitation that you received for today's session, and you'll be able to hear a playback of the session. So our first speakers today are Michael Mattis, who is the Butler County Maintenance Manager and PennDOT's, in PennDOT's District 10, Jason Powell, who is the Maintenance Operation Manager for PennDOT's District 2, and William Davenport, who is a Roadway Programs Manager in PennDOT's Bureau of Maintenance and Operations. I'd like to welcome Mike, Jason, and Will to today's session. And Jason, you now have control. Okay, good morning, everyone. As Danielle said, my name's Jason Powell. I'm the maintenance operations manager for PennDOT District 2 located in Clearfield. My co-presenter today is Mike Mattis, 
Senior Highway Maintenance Manager for Butler County and PennDOT District 10. Also joining us today is William Davenport from the Bureau of Maintenance and Operations. We are here today to discuss salt brine. Over the next 15 minutes, we will discuss various topics, including Why do we use salt brine? How using brine benefits the traveling public, along with fears and misconceptions of using brine. At this time and throughout the presentation, if you have any questions or fears and misconceptions of brine you would like us to discuss, please submit those now using the Q&A chat function. We'll begin with the primary function we utilize salt brine for, pre-wetting our winter solid materials. Pre-wetting is the process of adding liquid, in our case salt brine, to dry material before applying it to the road. This material can be straight rock salt, straight anti skid, or a mixture of each. The benefits to pre-wetting materials at the spinner or the auger is to help improve cold weather performance of our dry solids. We do that by reducing the amount of material lost to bounce and scatter and by jumpstarting the reaction needed to melt snow. Rock salt can melt ice down to pavement temps of negative six, but it takes a long time, even hours. We can help it melt faster by adding liquid. Pre-wetting, even with plain salt brine, will significantly increase the ice melting rate of salt even at cold temperatures. Dry salt alone can't melt snow. It must have liquid in some capacity to produce the reaction needed to melt snow. Dry salt can do this, but it takes time to pull enough moisture out of the air in the surrounding environment to start the process. By adding brine, we jumpstart the reaction, which makes our winter materials work faster. In this picture, you can see dry salt and wet salt cutting down into the block of ice side by side. The wet salt is penetrating more because it got a faster start due to the addition of brine. Motorists benefit from us pre-wetting our winter solids. By jumpstarting the reaction needed to melt snow, the time needed for our materials to visually appear to be working is reduced. Our roads begin to cut faster. The traveling motors see the effect of our hard work sooner. Let's talk about how brine helps reduce the amount of material we lose to bounce and scatter. Several factors influence bounce and scatter. Three are listed here. Using pre-wet salt causes less bounce and scatter. The wetter a material is, the less it bounces. And appropriate driving speeds are also a major contributor. The faster we drive, the harder it is to control, bounce, and scatter. Remember, dry material tends to bounce off the roadway before it has a chance to work, which we will discuss next. Bounce and scatter tends to waste material. A typical research project is demonstrated by this graph. If 100% of dry salt is spread in the center one third of a dry road, only 46% stays in the center with 30% of the dry salt immediately bouncing into the ditch upon application as illustrated here in blue. If we spread pre-wetted salt on the center third of a dry road, 78% remains in the center and only 4% bounces into the ditch during application, illustrated here in green. That's a 26% material savings by keeping the material on the road. We also know that as salt gets wetter, it bounces less, so the bounce depends on how wet it is. 10 gallons of brine per ton is our minimum recommended pre-wet goal, but 16 gallons per ton is even better. Some conditions 
are present when straight anti skid is preferred material choice. Even with straight skid, we should be pre wetting our material, reducing the effect of bounce and scatter. When straight skid is preferred material, there are still benefits to pre-wetting with brine. Dry anti-ice skid, rest on snow and ice surface does not bond well. The material may bounce off and scatter or be blown from the surface by traffic. Anti-ice skid, pre-wet with salt brine, Bonds to snow and ice, the salt brine reacts with the surface and immediately starts cutting, causing it to stick. The material is less likely to bounce and scatter or be affected by traffic. This slide here is demonstrating the effect of dry anti skid versus pre wet anti skid and how traffic can blow the material off the roadway. Question Can you save money and improve performance by using pre wet salt? The answer is yes, you can. Pre wetting material can help reduce your overall application rates by 26%, which helps us save money. The more money we save on winter operations, the more we have to utilize on summer projects. We have already showed how pre wet material can reduce scatter and bounce and on average keep 26% more material on the roadway. So with that in mind, we can turn down the application rates by 26% and see similar results. For example, a 400 pound application rate can be turned down to 296 pounds simply by adding more brine. Please keep in mind the brine you add is also adding more salt to the mix, 2.3 pounds of salt for every gallon of brine utilized. By using brine, we not only reduce bounce and scatter and reduce our application rates, but we also help our material react faster, providing better service to the traveling public. In essence, doing more with less. Jason, we have a question here. I'd like to just offer up at this point in time, since it is part of your presentation. Uh, we have a participant who's asking uh, for a little bit more clarification in terms of what anti-skid material is. So anti-skid material varies from depends on where you are in the state. It, it's a dry material kind of looks like a, a very gritty sand or a real fine crushed stone that we utilize in winter operations to help give temporary traction during snowstorms. Thank you. Now let's talk about a few common fears and misconceptions we hear regarding brine. First, 
When is it too cold to pre-wet with brine? Almost never. When properly mixed, our salt brine can melt snow and ice down to negative six degrees. We understand it takes a comfort level, so if it makes you feel better when it hits zero, you can begin to back the brine off. Anything above that, we recommend using it. I, however, have crews that use brine down to negative six degrees. Just for a what if scenario, if you are spreading 200 pounds per snow lane mile and utilizing 10 gallons of brine per ton, the amount of liquid you are using equals one gallon per mile or roughly one Vegas shot glass per 62 feet. That's not much at all. Another topic we often hear is brine will reduce the need for overtime. Brine does a lot of things. It will speed up the reaction needed to melt snow. It will reduce bounce and scatter. It will help reduce application rates. However, brine doesn't reduce the need for overtime. When making brine, more salt in the solution is better. That's a, that's a misconception we hear quite often. Salt melts snow and ice, so when making brine, the more salt I put in my brine, the better it'll be, right? Heat it up. Let's make this batch super strong. More salt is not better. Anyone ever make homemade ice cream? How do you chill it? By using lots of salt. If you overload the saturation point, you cross over from melting ice to making ice. That's why a strict quality control program is extremely important. The biggest problem with brine not working is a result of being made incorrectly. If the concentration level doesn't match the specification, there's no way to predict how well it will perform on the road. It must be made to the correct concentration level. If it's too weak or too strong, both will cause issues. If it's not quality brine, don't use it. In this photo are two common quality control devices. In orange, is a handheld reflectometer. The correct method to test brine. On the right is a hydrometer, the incorrect way to test brine. So to recap everything, brine can help us with winter operations. Brine can reduce bounce and scatter. It can help reduce application rate saving material and it can also speed up the reaction needed to melt snow and ice. But in order to successfully achieve a brine program, you must produce quality brine and test it often. Pre-wet solids during every storm using a minimum of 10 gallons per ton and grow as we go, meaning don't be afraid to grow and increase your brine usage as confidence builds. By using brine, the end result will be a more efficient and faster method to achieve safe possible roads. Thanks, Jason. I have a couple of questions for you from uh, the participants so far. Um, actually, a few, there's more coming in. So please, if you folks have additional questions to forward, there is what looks like a double chat kind of icon with a question mark on it. Feel free to click on there to submit your questions and I'll ask them as we go here. Let's start from the top. Uh, on a road that only calls for add a skid, can they still use brine? Should they still use brine? When, when we have those type of roads, yes, we, we still use brine. Now, uh, we use brine just for the pre reading purposes to reduce bounce and scatter on those roads. We didn't go out and soak them down with anti-icing tankers or anything along that nature. But the small amount that you're putting on there to control bounce and scatter won't, won't affect those roads. Has there been any study, Jason, of the cost of the cleanup associated uh, with the antiskid, whether it's sand or crushed stone? Uh, not to my knowledge. I, I No, not to my knowledge. Could you please also uh, repeat what the right instrument is to use to test the brine? Maybe even a little bit of a description of what the differences are between the two examples that you had shown on your slide. Sure, sure. 
So let, let's start with uh, the incorrect way to test brine, which is where I've seen many brine shops over the years uh, begin their program. So if you have a handheld hydrometer, which kind of looks like a long thermometer with a plumb bulb on the end and an old Kool-Aid pitcher, that's how a lot of first generation brine shops would attempt to test their brine. They would fill the water pitcher up with the brine, drop that little um, hydrometer in there and let it bounce around and kind of eyeball it to the level that it stopped bouncing at and say, yep, that's that's close or no, we need to make some adjustments. Very, very uh, inconsistent. And that's what got a lot of places in trouble with making poor brine. The correct way to test your brine and the, the hydrometer I was talking about would be that device on the right hand side of this slide. And so you would put that into a pitcher of brine, watch it bounce up and down and, and where it leveled off was your concentration level. The correct way to test your brine is with the orange device here in this photo. This is called a handheld refractometer. Now they come in in different modes, uh, depends on which one you buy, you know, the scale on it, whether it's percent by weight or saturation level. Um, you have to be careful which one you want to order here so you're talking the right scale. But this is the correct way to test your brine. So with this unit, you, you clean and calibrate it with some distilled water so it reads zero. You drop a few uh, eye drops of your brine into that silver eyelet right there, press the go button, and it reads you your concentration level. So that's the, that's the correct way to test your brine. Some of those models uh, have more than one feature on them to where you can actually flip it to freeze point, which I found is very beneficial when I'm dealing with our own field operators. Because if I tell them your, your brine's at 23.3% you know, concentration, doesn't mean a whole lot to, to a lot of field operators. But if I flip the mode over and show them and says, well, your brine's good down to negative six degrees Fahrenheit, now that means a lot to, to gain in confidence with, with different operators. Thanks, Jason. Another question here. Uh, when using brine or for the spraying of brine, is there certain equipment that you absolutely have to have? Or is there some wiggle room in there? Are there other uh, methods to um, employ its use? Um, well, I'll, I'll give several examples and, and Mike and Will feel free to jump in once I'm done here if you have anything else. You can use a lot of different things for that and, and you don't have to be very sophisticated if you're just getting started out. So of course, in our systems, we're talking about pre-wetting and so we have the ability to inject salt brine right into our material, either in the auger or in the back of the truck as it's coming out and being pushed over to the spinner, or it squirts down right on the spinner itself as it's being broadcast on the road. So that's one method. But if you don't have that ability and you want to try brine and you have the ability to get your hand on some brine, you can even just spray it on the top of your load and let it saturate down into your mixed material. Uh, I've even seen where operators will, will leave a little space in the bed of the truck um, from the, up towards the cab and they'll put some brine up in there and, and let it leach back through the load so they can experiment with it. So you can use it just about any way you can get it on your material to, to see how it works for you and the benefits of it. Uh, now that's talking pre-wetting. You know, there's a whole nother side to this coin uh, that we're not discussing, which is the anti-icing where we're using more of a tanker application and that takes a little more sophisticated equipment. But for today's topic, pre-wetting, just about any way you can get some material out there to see the benefits of it, it is, in my opinion, you know, a good way of doing it. Now, some of it is a little harder to control your application rates in terms of are you putting down 12 gallons per ton um, or are you just kind of guessing how much you're putting on the load, but you don't have to be too too elaborate with your equipment. Um, Mike, Will, any anything else to add to that or good? No, Jason, you covered everything, so thank you. Um, like Jason said, there are some counties that still have spray bars at our stockpiles. So as the operators load their either straight salt or in a skid or in a skid and salt mix, 
we'll drive underneath the spray bars as they leave our stockpile and pre-wet the material that way. Is there a time frame to use the pre-wet salt before you have to actually pre-wet it again? Uh, time frame to use the pre-wet salt before you have to pre-wet it again. No, not no, not the not that I can think of trying to understand that question. You know, our systems we pre-wet as we're putting it down, so we don't have the opportunity to to hit it again. If you're if you're soaking a load, chances are you're going to use most of that load, if not all of it, in, in your application at that time. So probably not a real good need to, to re-hit it. Um, now, of course, if you come in and re-top off, if you have a spray bar like what Mike was just talking about, you may want to add some more brine to it. But it isn't something that um, disappears in a short period of time to where you're going to have to worry about um, applying more to your load. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that, Jason. That's uh, all the questions we have for now. Again, the reminder, please, please uh, feel free to use the live event Q&A, which is the double thought bubble kind of thing with a question mark in the dark square. Uh, click on that and feel free to uh, submit a question or comment as our presenters proceed. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Ken. I actually do have an additional question. I wonder if uh, Jason can talk a little bit, and I know we also have Dan Hartman on the line with us today, a little bit about PennDOT's agility program and how local governments can, can utilize the agility program when it comes to winter services. Um, sure, Dan and, and Mike, do you two want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, I... I can give a, a little bit of a brief background for everybody um, on the call who uh, is wondering what is agility. Uh, agility is a type of legal agreement that allows PennDOT and eligible partners like a local government, a county government, or you know even another state agency uh, to respond to situations by exchanging services rather than doing something like, uh, you know, we'll do some sort of work and you pay us to do it. Um, what this is, is it uses a simple resolution passed by a local government board and it enables the director of public works or roadmaster or the chairperson of the board to uh, negotiate an agility work plan where you will list out an even exchange of services where uh, a township or a borough or a city or a county, like I said, can do one thing and in exchange PennDOT will do another thing. It's something that's existed for about 25 years uh, here in the department, we've done uh, about 4,000 of these sort of uh, exchanges over that period. It's a great opportunity to really uh, optimize uh, fleets and, uh, and and workforce on both sides. So, you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to, uh, you know, Mike and, and Jason, if you want to talk about from a, a hands-on aspect, what, what agility is um, and, and, and what it can do with different things like salt brine. Thanks, Dan. Um, I want to start off by saying each county in PennDOT um, will do separate agility agreements per county. Um, each county has a specific individual who is responsible to handle the agility program. Um, the interested party would contact that individual to set up the agreements and to talk with uh, various people in that organization of what kind of agreement you want to have. Um, in Butler County, uh, we've had agreements on both ways where townships have came in and got salt brine from us. Uh, we also have an agreement where we can go get salt brine from a township um, at one of our stockpiles that are further away from our home base in Butler. So there's various options to an agility agreement that um, the different municipalities, townships, boroughs, cities, state parks uh, can utilize. So if you are interested, you can always call your local PennDOT, or if you have questions, feel free to email or call me. My contact information is up on a screen. I'm sure Jason uh, wouldn't mind either. Yes, cor correct. If, if, there, if anyone has any questions regarding agility or brine or anything that we talked about today, uh, by all means, re reach out to me or reach out to Mike and we'll assist you any way we can. 
any further questions? Yeah, I, do have, uh, I do have a few more that have come in since sure. then. Uh, I have a comment here, um, just an observation, I guess, from somebody who has some experience with uh, the brine. Spraying the loads in the bed is not necessarily the most efficient uh, and not recommended practice. As stated, it will help. However, uh, the most efficient way is to apply the brine at the spinner or in the auger. You want to comment on that at all? or? No, I absolutely agree with that. Um, absolutely agree with that. The, just the scenario we were given is if you didn't have the the ability to purchase those liquid systems to apply it at the auger and the spinner, then applying it on your your load directly by spray bar is is a decent option to look at. But no, uh, the spot on. The most efficient way is right into the auger or the spinner itself if you have the ability to do that. So yes. And how bad is brine for the environment if it gets into streams or creeks? The the small amount that we're using in a pre-wetting application, um, it, it doesn't reach that magnitude. You know, environmentally, it's just like anything else. If if you dump a a ten thousand gallon tanker into into a stream, then yeah, of course you're you're going to have some significant issues. But when you look at the pre-wetting rates that we're applying you know, one gallon of liquid per mile at, at a decent application rate or, or shot glass every 62 feet, that that liquid is being absorbed by that material to control bounce and scatter and not running um, all over the place. And what is the name of that device again to test the brine refractometer? Correct, correct. That's a handheld refractometer. OK, that's all we have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ken. Um, thanks to Jason, Mike and Will for their presentation today. Again, uh, if you have additional questions for Jason, Mike and Will, uh, please use the chat pod on the right hand side of your screen uh, to enter those questions. And um, looks like we'll probably have some time at the end uh, to circle back to those additional questions. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker is Todd Homan, who is the Blair County Assistant Maintenance Manager in Pendas District 9. Todd's going to be talking about uh, winter fleet preparation. So Todd, I'm going to give you the, the control here and um, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, as Daniel said, my name is uh, Todd Homan. I'm the Assistant County Manager for Blair County. And my presentation today is on uh, winter preparation and what we do to get our fleet ready. Basically, um, getting our trucks ready for winter operations and how we accomplish that. Sorry for the slight delay and the lag. Okay, there we go. So our objectives, what we try to do is um, how do we as a county make, get our trucks ready for winter service? So first we establish a, a team. The team is about five to six people. A garage firm, a foreman would be the supervisor or we would appoint uh, a supervisor. We develop a summer and a winter transitional schedule. Typically we start and the beginning of October, we try to finish by the first week in November. We do finish by the first week in November. Um, it's a tough go about to get the trucks ready for winter because we're still trying to do some summer work and clean up some of the things that we had for the summer. We install and verify winter components. Winter components being the spreaders, the salt brine tanks, the GLs, the the equipment that are there inside the truck would be the GL 400s, the Freedoms, and the XDSs. They are the brains of the uh, the salt in the putting the material out to the spreader. We also repair 614 deficiencies. A 614 is a daily report that our operators would use to write down anything that would be wrong with the truck. Therefore, our mechanics could go in and fix that. We also 
use it as operator development. We put some new employees in there as long as seasoned employees, you know, to try to get people to understand our equipment and how it works and, and, and putting it all together so they understand the verification slash um, the, the, the verification and calibration aspect of the salt. So with the establishment of the, the team, as I said in the previous slide, we typically have a foreman or a lead worker. We have four operators. The operators are actually field operators or operators, and they're the people that will actually attach the spreaders, bring the spreaders over and put it on. They'll help with uh, getting the salt to calibrate or verify the augers. We also have two mechanics typically, one mechanic that does the verification. One mechanic does the, he does the anything with the 614s or anything we could fix on the spot that would be, a, that would have a truck that we could get maybe a light out or whatnot that we could get fixed before it goes back out into the field. So the team participates in both summer and winter, and obviously we have a winter to summer transition. Um, we try to rotate operators annual, annually. Um, so we, what we try to do is get everybody on, whether you have 25 years or two years, we just we try to rotate everybody so they understand the process. What, what the team is responsible for, retrieving, staging, and storage of fleet equipment. That is probably the hardest part at this time of the year, getting trucks in here. Uh, we make a schedule and whatnot, but it's hard with people using trucks and with spreaders on the trucks, it's hard to use for field operations. Mounting and unmounting of spreaders and tanks. It takes a little bit of time. We, we have a system and that's why we try to rotate operators on and off so the operators are on there can show the new operators how we, we do it. We verify and calibrate the spreaders in the brine system. We call it verification. It's it's a calibration, but we don't truly um, bite. We just we call it verification. We do calibrate it, but it's a verification of the spreaders and brine system. Cleaning and detailing of the trucks. Obviously, these trucks are in salt most of the winter, and it's hard on the vehicles. They're a lot of money, over two hundred thousand. We try to come in, not only do we clean them through the winter, but twice a year minimum, we bring them in, we thoroughly clean them, we wash them, we wax them. Um, if we can bring the operator and it drives that truck during the, the process of the putting the spreaders on, we'll have them come in and we wash and clean the trucks outside, inside, under the bed rails where the salt or anything would 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 seem to get in there to, to hurt the truck. We we do that with all the wiring systems. It's important that we do that. We ensure the 614 deficiencies are corrected. Again, the 614s are a, a log that the foreman, I'm sorry, that the operators fell on every day they get in a piece of equipment or they run a piece of equipment, have it, they tow a piece of equipment, we fill out a 614 to make sure it's correct before we take it down the road. Countywide participation ensures total buy-in from all of the employees. So we try to get everybody to buy in. The equipment is expensive. It's hard to come by. You know, we want to protect our investments. Proper storage. Um, what we try to do, we found, is we, we store the spreaders by stockpile location. It makes it easier um, instead of them how behind one another and you can't find the spreader for what truck we label the spreaders or what the number of the spreader the spreader has a number it correlates with the truck and we store them in an orderly fashion as to not damage them they're expensive we also um uh, they're, they're easily removed by the forklift we found that instead of putting in 
on the ground or whatnot, they're easily uh, removed and brought over for on the trucks. So we develop a summer winter transition schedule. The schedule is drafted by the equipment manager. The assistant county manager obviously helps. We take into account ongoing field operations. This is a uh, to your right, that's basically the stock pals. And then we would put the amount of trucks and when they're coming in for the spreaders to be put on and then to be verified or calibrated. The left hand picture is a checkoff list. We found that if, I, if we put one person, whether it's the mechanic supervisor or the foreman, whoever is in charge, if they actually personally come in and sign off the truck has been verified the spreader has been put on we sign off on it therefore we know it's ready to go back to the stock pile we try to obviously complete this in a four-week period it's it's challenging but we we get it every year it's, so that's kind of that's kind of how the schedule goes I, it's very challenging at times to get trucks in here with we're trying to especially if the weather's decent and we're trying to do some work out on the road, good work out on our roads. So to install and verify the winter components. So obviously we're putting a spreader on the back of the truck. And we just, we also, as in the last presentation, we have a brine systems, they're installed. They're verified and adjusted. Um, proper verification is, a, is critical, you know, operation of success. We want to make sure our road systems are safe. We have department goals and objectives, and safe travel for the motoring public is obviously the most important. We want to put the proper amount of material down to allow safe travel on our roads. So another part of the preparation is we like to work smart. We want to use the proper equipment typically that we have a forklift we also have a loader in the yard we do this in our 01 in our garage that's the main part of the tool, the equipment that the operators will use tools our mechanics have the tools that we need to attach the spreaders um and the salt brine systems to the trucks and proper technique obviously lifting we want two people minimum lifting we don't want to hurt anyone's back proper lifting is important so the 614 deficiencies as i said before a 614 for the people that don't know it's a a daily report log that we would an operator would before he gets in the truck he would check all the fluids check the tires check for loose lug nuts, anything that a normal truck driver would go. It's a pre-trip inspection, basically, air brake test. We review the 614s for any kind of deficiencies. And with that being said, sometimes when they're in here, we can get those corrected. Um, things that wouldn't necessarily deadline a truck, we would get those fixed before we put them out onto the road. And then if we cannot do that, we would schedule repairs for some items that need to come into the garage for a more, uh, more thorough work. So winter preparation, also operator development. We do snow academy. We talk about application rates and how much material we wanna put on the road per lane mile. We talk about operational strategies. Uh, when we're going to put salt down or, or in a skid or 50 50 mix when we're going to be plowing the road um, using the appropriate appropriate mixes for the proper road monitoring how the material is working on the road we also do dry runs very important especially all employees but especially for the newer employees with winter routes each employee here has a designated route we like them to go out we run the routes we, t we uh, have a a dry run that they will fill out. What we're looking for is any deficiencies on the roadway. What maybe a limb came down and we need to get it cut off so it doesn't hit the truck. We have head walls or drainage systems. Maybe they need, we put delineation out. So when you're plowing, it seems easy when, when there's no snow on the road, but 
we'd like to get the lineation out so you're not hitting a head wall or a curb. Also, concrete barriers, which um, islands, if we split four lanes, it seems easy when you're driving down the road now, but when you put a couple inches of snow, a foot of snow on the road, you need a delineator out there to show you where you should move the plow over is not to hit it. These are part of dry run efforts, and, and it gets the guys out to learn the roads they're on. Plus, we like to get them onto some other roads in case they have to go on another road that might not be their normal winter route. We then, we would get the dry run sheets in the office and we would schedule work to go out and, and do delineation, do some tree trimming, do things that we might need to do to correct so we're not having any issues with damaging our trucks. I think that's the same, you, you can continue that, that's the same um, slide. I, I must have put it in there twice, I'm sorry, Daniel. So that's basically what I have. I appreciate the time. Uh, if there's any questions, I would be, I would try to answer anything you, you may have. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you. And uh, the first one is, how many trucks can you actually outfit in a single day? Good question. Um, typically, it varies. It's, it's, it's not as easy. It's not a typical black and white question. We try to outfit two to three, maybe four trucks a day. Putting the spreaders on and putting the um, salt brine systems on, they're not that bad. However, Sometimes the verification takes a little longer. Maybe the, the GL or the XDS is not, we can't get it right. So, or the wires through the winter, something happened. That's the, sometimes it's hard, but we try to get four trucks a day if we can. That That's the goal. And, and you have to understand it's not just putting um, the, the, the spreaders and whatnot on. We try to wax them and um, we do stuff, you know, wash and wax and stuff and stuff along those lines. How long does it take uh, to actually be able to verify and calibrate one truck? Well, our, we have a, a great mechanic and, and he, he does a great job. So it, it can he can do about two to three in a day if he's not having any issue, bringing the salt over, getting the salt, we run it through into a, a, a 55 gallon barrel, which we cut in half, and then we weigh it and, and stuff along those lines. So we try to get two to three of those per day. And as you can see, with putting the spreaders on at four and we're only getting two or three, sometimes we get a little backlogged with the, with the verification or calibration of the truck, um, obviously with wash and wax, and it all works out. Todd, Dave asks, uh, after a truck is calibrated, if the spreader is then taken off, does that truck need to be recalibrated again? That's a great question. Um, we do that. We, we, if, if it's called the trim of the truck, which gets set in the, the computer in the inside. So if you took the spreader off, which we do, and we take it out to go back out to do field operations, whether we're putting a pipe in or whatnot, our mechanic tells me that typically it does not need verified again. However, if you would hook a broom or something that would use the hydraulics of the to the back of it, then you have to change the trim. So yes, then it would need recalibrated or verified. Steve McDonald has a, a couple of questions here pertaining to the drivers. Uh, First of all, are your drivers exempt from federal CDL requirements? No, they're not. They they fall, I believe they fall under CDL requirements from the federal government. That they're not exempt that I know. No. How many hours are your drivers required to run on each shift? And how many shifts are there? Well, required, we run two shifts in this county. Um, eight hour shifts, seven and a half paid, but we covered each shift would cover 12 hours. Um, so 
a new, we actually run, which is called an A shift and a B shift. We run a noon to eight. The noon shift would stay till midnight if it was snowing. The other shift would be four in the morning till noon. That shift would come in early at midnight. So we would have midnight till noon would be one shift and noon to midnight would be another shift. Also, do you uh, do you use any checklists or have any documentation that can be easily implemented in other areas or used by others? In terms of, of what checklists for winter winter fleet, uh, the preparation of the winter fleet. We have we have all of our equipment. Yes, listed. We have all of our plows listed, our spreader, everything by by uh, number, equipment number, it's easily accessed. We know if a plow would break, what other pl spare plows we would have, if that's the kind of information you need. Everything has an equipment number. It's easy accessible, it's easy to find. Our equipment manager handles most of that. He, we have all that information as well. Would there be any uh, benefit in sharing that type of documentation as an example that others could follow in setting up their own program for tracking and monitoring? Sure, I have um, a system and I've been using it for a couple years and as anyone doing anything, I'm, I'm constantly upgrading the spreadsheet to put little uh, Keller code now, a little more than I did. And I have the equipment numbers and everything on there constantly updating our spreadsheets and making them a little better as I you know I feel like well I might this seems like it helps a little bit or maybe an employee say hey it'd be nice to have this where they're actually boots on the ground and give me some advice where I take them like wow that's a good idea so yes I have I have stuff that I could share if anyone would like anything in term in terms of uh checklists for trucks how we when we go out to verify them and, and wash and wax them our our plow checklist our spreader checklist things along that nature. So maybe if any of uh, those folks who are attending today's session uh, may have the need or some interest in uh, seeing that type of material, please feel free to indicate that in the live event Q&A or even submit any additional questions or comments you might have for Todd. Todd, I have another question here if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, based off the example schedule that, <clears throat> that you provided uh, regarding the, the transition to winter, do you do all the repairs in-house or do you have to account for mechanics outside the county or PennDOT to do maintenance work? Uh, good question. Typically, we do a lot of in-house repairs. Now we do put stuff out if it's warranty work and stuff might need go, might need to go to a dealership that requires, you know, it's a, it's a, not that our mechanics couldn't do it, but it's a warranty issue. So we would, you know, we would get them to fix it. Most of our stuff, is fixed in house though I would say but but if need be yes we've we've sent stuff out to um, a Mac garage or international garage or whatever it may be to to fix warranty work very good right now uh, that's actually all I have for additional questions or comments if we uh, receive any additional I'll make sure to hold those uh, to the end to ask at that point in time thanks Todd. Thanks. I appreciate it. And if anybody would like to email me personally, my email is listed there and I would get them the information, any information that I had or might help them in terms of Excel spreadsheets or whatever I may have. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, Todd, this is Danielle. I actually have a question with regard to winter fleet preparation. Um, sure. Are is there any sort of, um, I'm, I'm sure there is to some degree, some collaboration coordination uh, across counties there in District uh, 9 or even across um, districts, like adjoining districts to District 9 in terms of winter fleet preparation? Um, if maybe if there is, if you could explain a little bit about some of that coordination. I would say coordination in terms of putting spreaders in, in getting trucks ready for winter is more of a county. However, we definitely, definitely talk to other adjacent counties, adjacent districts in terms of winter snow removal, what they're seeing in terms of road conditions. We reach out across counties and districts to see how the road, obviously the weather's traveling a certain way. You might want to get vehicles out or we're starting to see weather come on our road. I'm not going to say it happens much with the coordination of, of putting spreaders and whatnot on, but sure, 
Um, we definitely talk in terms of weather related between counties and districts all the time. All right, well, thank you so much, Todd. We certainly appreciate your time today. Some great information being provided, some great questions that we're getting in from the audience. Um, again, if you have further questions for Todd or for um, our previous speakers, Jason, uh, Mike, or Will, please again, use that chat pod to submit those questions. Um, and with that, we're gonna move on to our uh, last speaker for today's session. Um, his name is Sam Gregory. Um, he is a technical advisor and instructor for PennDOT's Local Technical Assistance Program. So we're going to welcome uh, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Danielle. Um, as Danielle said, I'm Sam Gregory and I uh, do the technical stuff for the Local Technical Assistance Program that is actually uh, sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and obviously goes down to PennDOT and then is administered by the uh, Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors. And my presentation, uh, Winter Maintenance Best Practices for Local Government Agencies, kind of fits in with everything else that we've been talking about today. Uh, what we're trying to do is provide information to the local governments, uh, just like PennDOT does. We're trying to get everyone to be as an efficient and obviously effective in their winter maintenance strategies. And as diverse as Pennsylvania is, uh, there, there's a lot of communication that has to be done to get all the innovative ideas out there, all the best practices out there. And what we do is we do that through several means. And again, folks, you're going to see a lag. OK, there we go with the next slide. Um, knowledge sharing of the best practices. We have several ways of doing that. Uh, and I'll go down through them and then I'll elaborate in some of the uh, further slides on how we do that. Uh, first of all, we have quarterly newsletters and technical sheets. There's technical sheets. Uh, not only do we talk about winter services, but we talk about paving uh, anytime the specifications changes, anytime there's new uh, techniques for operations, we will put them in the newsletter or we will create uh, a separate standalone text sheet for that. Uh, all these text sheets, I'm going to at the end, we will show you the LTAP website. All these text sheets and newsletters can be found on the uh, LTAP website. If you're in need, even the ones that have been done in the past, you can go to the website and pull them up. And what I like about the newsletters uh, and the text sheets, it's not only done by the LTAP personnel, uh, it is also done by industry experts and uh, at times PennDOT joins in and they will help uh, write articles or help with the text sheets. Probably the biggest thing we do for uh, knowledge sharing is the technical assistance. And as the slide indicates, we do both over the phone and field visits. Uh, I may get a question over the phone pertaining to a specification. Uh, someone has uh, a problem out there that we don't have to go out and physically be there that we can talk them through over the phone. We will do that. Uh, the field visits, uh, we do a lot of those throughout the year. Uh, I'm actually semi-retired and I keep saying at one of these points, uh, if the field visits drop down, I probably will fully retire. Um, a lot of those pertain to winter maintenance and I will show you a slide here shortly, uh, one of the ones we do quite often. Probably the biggest way we knowledge share the innovations is through the participation in the National Build a Better Mousetrap competition. Like I said, uh, LTAP is funded, starts with the Federal Highway Administration, uh, and it is a national program. LTAP has a center in every state in the uh, country, and the Federal Highway Administration uh, sponsors this competition and what we're looking for is proven innovations that have uh, like one of the previous presenters said helps them make 
the work easier and better. So we solicit uh, ideas from across the state from uh, local governments and it is entered into the competition at the state level. The winner at the state level then is entered in the national level. And uh, so it's, it's a pretty good way of getting the innovative techniques shared out there from one end of the state to the other. Uh, I will go over three of those and, and some slides here in a second. Um, we also do drop-ins and webinars. Now, we just started doing the drop-ins. Uh, the difference between the two, the drop-in is very informal. And what we're trying to do is create a discussion uh, with everyone that's participating and not just uh, lecture and not just provide information, but to also share knowledge from all the participants so everyone can learn from all the people that are involved in the drop-ins. And of course, we do maintenance and traffic safety courses. Since I'm a maintenance guy, I will be talking solely about the maintenance and uh, hitting the winter maintenance end of it. But there are a lot of technical advisors out there that do traffic safety courses if you need traffic counts at the local level or they can help you with speed limits, signage, etc. cetera. Um, the caveat you see with the asterisks, due to the COVID-19, uh, we switched over to do the course offerings virtually, which uh, I will have to admit at first, I wasn't sure that was gonna work, uh, but even someone who's not very good with the technical aspect uh, can get it to work and we're having great success with that. Uh, we shut down the field tech assist for a while until the numbers dropped uh, for COVID and now we will go out and do field technical assist as long as we and the municipalities follow uh, the local guidelines for uh, safety requirements for the, the COVID. Talking about the tech assist, um, one of the tech assists that when it pertains to best practices for winter for local governments, uh, we go out and we will help the local governments do a calibration of their spreaders, uh, just like the Mike, the last uh, speaker was talking about. Um, and again, it is a best practice. It not only helps make you efficient and effective, but it also uh, helps with the reduce the environmental impacts of the material you're using out there. Basically, what we will do is we will, some will someone will ask if they can get a tech assist to help with the calibration. Uh, and we will ask them to invite neighboring municipalities. So we're not just going out there and hitting one municipality. Uh, they invite the neighboring municipalities and uh, we will go through the calibration techniques uh, and basically what I will do or one of the other advisors will do, we will physically calibrate a truck for them and we will talk about ahead of time why we do it, but then we will talk them through it, how we're doing it. And then after that, we will ask the other municipalities that are taking part uh, if they will start to calibrate those uh, trucks and we will walk around and help anybody if anybody has any problems or if anybody uh, needs assistance and that way we can get several areas, uh, several municipalities can get their uh, at least one of their trucks calibrated during that time and then they can go back and they have the knowledge on how to do the rest of their fleet. Um, if you know me, uh, you know I like to tell stories and this was a very hard concept to get across to a lot of the local governments. You know, basically they said they know what they're doing. Uh, they can look in the mirror and tell whether they're putting the right amount of material down or not. Um, and that really, you can't do that. Uh, you may think you can, but you really can't do that scientifically. Um, last year, last summer, uh, not this summer, but the summer before, uh, I had a roadmaster come up and ask me if uh, I would be willing to help them do a calibration on their new truck they uh, had just purchased. And the interesting part was the supervisors, the elected supervisors were also there and they really didn't see the need for it. The one supervisor said to me, it's a new truck. I don't really think we need you to do that. 
But if you're willing to do it and keep in mind the LTAP services are free of charge to local governments, all it cost them was a little bit of their time. Um, when I went out to do the calibration, what we, first what we found out were the hydraulics weren't hooked up correctly. So before we could try to calibrate it, uh, we had to rearrange the hydraulics. And after that, uh, there was still a problem with the hydraulics and the lowest application rate we could get uh, on setting one, they use manual uh, spreaders as opposed to some of the ground speed control or the uh, computer spreaders. Uh, the lowest amount we could get out was 800 pounds per uh, mile. And obviously that's way too much material, even though they use a mix and not straight salt, it still costs money. And the one supervisor who didn't realize the benefit when we talked about it initially came up and said, I'm glad we did this. Number one, we would have looked foolish if we couldn't have got the material out at the first storm. And that amount, we got to fix the hydraulics because at that amount, we're going to run out of material. So even the people that are a little skeptical are coming around and uh, see the benefit. I have probably done over time, and I've been doing this for a long time, I've probably done all around 75 or 100 of these across the state. Now, I also talked about the Build a Better Mousetrap. Uh, and again, this is a, an annual competition. Uh, federal uh, government uh, does it from a national perspective. And when they have their national conference, uh, they look at all the submissions from the winners from all the states, and then they choose uh, what they think is the winner of the competition. And in Pennsylvania, we solicit it and try to get people to send in their innovations. Uh, I know I talk about it when I'm out. If I see something that I think is innovative, something new, something that can be shared, I talk about it and encourage them to spread the word out there. Uh, this is an older one. Uh, it was done in 2013. And Nazareth Borough in Northampton County, and again, not as sophisticated as PennDOT is, but uh, they were trying to get involved in anti-icing. They come up with a way to make the brine in those totes and to actually put the tote uh, onto a truck and they put the spray bar into the hitch and uh, I believe they put a pump on there and that way they could anti-ice with a smaller vehicle. Of course, they had to vet it and make sure that they weren't overloading that truck. Uh, but, you know, like, like one of the previous speakers said, you learn to walk before you can really run with it. So this was one of the Build a Better mouse traps that uh, we actually promoted in our uh, winter maintenance training that we give every uh, year. One that's a little bit more recent, uh, in 2017, this was the first place winner in the 2017 competition. And I like this for a variety of reasons. Uh, this was done by Whitehall Township up in Lehigh County. And uh, from my perspective, this does a couple things. Uh, not only does it protect the material from the elements, which helps with your winter maintenance operations, it also helps with uh, the stormwater runoff from an environmental perspective. And the competition, uh, probably similar to what PennDOT does with their innovation ideas, is we start out with a problem, state, problem statement. Uh, they get their heads together and discuss how they're going to solve the problem, and uh, they track the costs, uh, and then they come up with, you know, why was it done? What are you saving? What are the benefits, et cetera? And if you're in a area where you are regulated by the municipal separate storm sewer systems or what we call the MS4s. Um, one of the minimum control measures is to make sure you do good housekeeping. And good housekeeping uh, applies to a lot of different things, but obviously uh, you do, do not want your material, you do not want your salt uh, getting running off the area and contaminating the stormwater runoff. Um, even though you have it in a building, uh, sometimes it's not pushed back beyond the drip line or the wind and rain can still get to it. 
So they wanted to come up with a way to a quick way to come up with a cover for their uh, opening of their salt shed that could be repairable, etc. Um, that's what their problem statement was, their solution. They got their heads together and they come up with a functional, obviously, uh, repairable shed opening uh, with the material that they had. And you can see the cost, the material was uh, 1190 labor 2600, uh, equipment 500. And again, like I said, not only is it helping with their winter maintenance operation to keep the salt from getting uh, contaminated, getting the rain on it and uh, cresting up, but it also helps them comply with their MS4 requirements for housekeeping. Twenty twenty. Uh, this was a runner up and it was interesting. Uh, some of the previous presentations talked about uh, the need to install and take off your spreaders if you get an, uh, get some open weather where you're not into a winter operation mode and you want to use the truck for something else. Uh, this was done by London Grove Township in Chester County. And they wanted to uh, come up with a way, again, acknowledging that there were times when they needed to transition from a winter mode to a uh, road maintenance mode. And it, it, again, you, the previous speaker talked about, it's not the easiest thing to do. I've been there, done that in uh, some of my past life. Uh, so we'll get to the next slide here. Yes, well, the, the problem statement again uh, for the entry into it. They wanted to come up with an efficient method to install and store the spreaders. Uh, so they looked at some the area they had in their building. They wanted to util utilize some wall space that was available. So they uh, built a rack on that wall space and they come up with a uh, portable hydraulic vehicle lift to remove the spreaders, get them over to the rack, put them on the rack, get them off the rack, get them back over and get them on the equipment. Uh, very little cost to this one, $200. And again, by doing this, they can do it. Uh, this kind of amazed me. They can do it with one individual. And again, savings and benefits. Well, as the, one of the previous speakers talked about, um, you need to do it in an efficient manner quickly. Uh, certainly if a snowstorm sneaks up on you and you're not prepared, you don't have the spreader on, you're scrambling around. So this makes them a little bit more efficient when they're uh, taking the spreaders off for a summer type operation and putting them back on uh, when there's an impending winter storm. Uh, this slide, as with the previous slide, you could can see the contact information if you need any more information on uh, these build a better mousetrap ideas. OK, I talked a little bit about the virtual drop ins. Uh, we just had one, I believe it, it was uh, the 1st of October when we did this, uh, trusting my memory. Uh, we put it together. We had an individual that works for a municipality. We had some of the PennDOT technical experts and myself, and we went over making of the salt brine. We talked about uh, the need for getting a quality salt brine. It was talked about before and some of the testing of it um, and how you can get it. If you don't want to have a brine maker yourself, there are commercial people that will sell it to you, and we talked about the agility program, uh, the trading of services that uh, could be done through the PennDOT in order for you to get the salt brine if you want to try some out. And we uh, put in uh, what you see in the center is the guidelines uh, from PennDOT about when it's a good idea to uh, use brine ahead of the storm and when you may not want to. The decision tree right out of their uh, PennDOT Publication 23 Maintenance Manual, and that helps if you're just getting into it. Uh, gives you some guidance so you don't have problems with it. There are times uh, 
that you may not want to do it if the temperature is going to drop rapidly and you have a dry snow that if you put the brine on it normally would blow off and the temperature drops and it may stick and refreeze so it, it gives you a guidance as to uh, when and when not to do it and the picture you see on the right uh, there was a question in the previous presentation or one of the presentations about do you need sophisticated equipment the picture on the right is a utility truck uh, from a township down in Lancaster County. They put the tank in the back of the truck. They uh, again put the uh, spray bar in the hitch. Uh, they plumbed it down to the spray bar. It does have a pump on it and it helps them obviously as opposed to some of the PennDOT roads. Uh, municipalities have tighter, narrower streets, cul-de-sacs, etc. And it helped them uh, get around in uh, different areas and help them uh, get into the uh, anti-icing technique with it. And what I found interesting about this drop-in, uh, quite often I do things and I give it the, uh, being a realist, I give it the so what factor. And when you go through some of these things, you're like, okay, did, did it make any impact? Uh, when we do the drop-ins, we ask poll questions and one of the poll questions right up front was how many people that were uh, involved in the drop-in actually do anti-icing and a little less than 50 percent of the people that were involved in the drop-in actually did anti-icing the last poll question that we did was after sitting through this session how many people that don't do anti-icing the other 50 percent I uh, thought they may give it a try and uh, I was pleasantly surprised that 40% of the people that weren't presently doing anti-icing after going through and getting more information and again the information just didn't come from me PennDOT uh, it came from uh, other municipalities chimed in that have already been doing it for a long time 40% said yes they were going to go give it a try so that to me meant that drop in was very successful. All right, and lastly, but not leastly, uh, obviously LTAP offers courses, and again, both traffic courses, uh, traffic safety courses, and maintenance courses. And we updated several years ago, we updated the, what we called the winter maintenance course, and we called it salt and snow management. Um, and we had been giving that for the last few years out there across the state. Uh, upon request, somebody will request it and uh, we shoot for a minimum of 15 people in the courses. Sometimes in the rural areas we will lower that a little bit, but you could have up to 50, 60 people in there. Uh, that's stretching it, but uh, we gave the salt management course quite a bit. And like I said earlier, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Like I said earlier, uh, since we went to the virtual aspect of it, the salt and snow management was a full day course. And at that point we said, you know, sitting there for a full day uh, listening to a virtual course might be a stretch. So what we decided to do uh, due to the COVID restrictions and going virtually, we decided to condense the salt and snow management to a half day virtual course, uh, emphasizing the best practices for an efficient and effective winter maintenance operation. Um, I added a little bit on anti-skid because uh, if you're familiar with Pennsylvania in the eastern part of the state, you have more urban areas and more traffic. They have a tendency to use more straight salt. I deal mostly with the rural western part of the state and they had comments on the courses that we didn't talk a lot about anti-skid. So we put in the winter maintenance 101. We changed the name not to say it isn't confused with salt and snow management. And what we did was we added an anti-skid and a mixture component to it for the people that uh, normally just do a mix instead of the straight salt. They don't have the roadways or the traffic. I do courses. I've done courses in the very rural areas that had all unpaved roads and obviously they're not going to use straight salt on their unpaved roads. So we have changed that. 
uh, we have made it virtual. Uh, we have added some new uh, videos that we received from uh, one of the national LTAP centers out in Iowa. Um, so hopefully that will be a good way to not only share knowledge, but to uh, get this out to the individuals and uh, some of the newer people in the municipalities, give them some uh, educational instruction on uh, basic winter maintenance operations. Uh, that will be coming to you soon. I am going to do a test on it tomorrow. And after we do the test and make sure the videos are going to play, uh, look for it, uh, look for the offerings on the LTAP website. Look for the offerings if you are in the LTAP website. They usually put out a email telling you there's a new course offering virtual out there and some of the planning partners will also remind you. I, I will say though, I do have to say that uh, the principles of paving course that is a full day course that has also been updated. It's uh, we just did the pilot of it. I didn't, but Pannoni's people did. And the way we're going to handle virtual full day courses is give them in two half days. Half of the course will be done on one day. The second half will be uh, done on the next day. So that's a little bit of a change to the LTAP virtual courses. And finishing up with the next slide. Here's the contact information. Uh, obviously, you can see my contact information, and yes, I am a Buffalo Bills fan. Uh, I've waited a long time for them to uh, start winning, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but the best thing you can do is if you don't use the LTAP website, I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you need a course, if you want to find a course that's out there, if you want to find some of those newsletters or technical sheets, you can get them from there. Uh, it's just a good resource for you to use to sign up. Uh, we do a Road Scholars program, Road Scholar 1 and Road Scholar 2, which is a professional certification program that a lot of the municipal employees are going through. Um, and you can also go to the 1-800-4-LTAP. Uh, like I said, LTAP is a federal highway program. Uh, it, the money is given to PennDOT. PennDOT contracts out the administration of it. If you go to the 1 800 4 LTAP phone number, you will get uh, someone in the PennDOT, uh, not the PennDOT office since they're not there, but you will get the PennDOT people that help with the LTAP program and they can get you to the right place for the information you're seeking. Uh, and again, if anybody needs to get a hold of, for, of me for anything, uh, you can get a hold of me with my contact information you see on the slide. You can call LTAP and they'll, the 1 800, they'll hunt me down, or you could even go to PSATS and uh, the PSATS people can find me. So, with that, that's basically all I have, folks. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, PennDOT for letting me participate. And if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, we'll go to them now. Sam, thanks very much. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. One uh, is, is basically somewhat of an observation. You mentioned COVID-19 and turning to virtual methods to get work out um, or get information out for people to be able to use and access and attain training by. Um, how is COVID basically shaping the way in which LTAP is doing its business? And do you foresee maybe any shifts in the future moving forward once COVID has run its course? How might well, it change the way business is normally conducted? Moving well, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Um, I do not have a crystal ball. Um, I am just a dumb old country boy. I prefer face to face instruction. Um, and I will be honest, I, they had to kind of twist my arm to get into the virtual end of it. Um, but since then, I can see the success of it. Um, one of the benefits of doing it virtually is if I was to do it in person, I might go up to Erie County or somewhere like that and have 25 people in, in person. Uh, now I get people all over the state for the virtual courses. I did a conference uh, for the University of Virginia for a roadway management conference for the Middle Eastern states, and I actually had 128 people uh, participating in uh, one of the seminars I did. What do I see in the future? 
Um, I'm not really sure. I know a lot of people like the Federal Highway Administrations, they like webinars. It cuts down on the travel. Uh, it touches more people from different areas like I talked about. I would hope, I just talked to one of the other uh, instructors yesterday who is like me, he feels more comfortable doing it in person. Uh, we are hoping sometime in 2021 we can get back out there. Uh, if not spring, fall, spring, summer rather, hopefully by uh, next fall we can go back out and do it in person. The, the only, and, and it's not a negative, but the, the only advantage, one of the advantages to doing it in person is when someone asks a question, quite often I need more information. Uh, and, and the back and forth in person lends uh, better for myself and other people to get to the specifics of the question. It's a little easier to answer the questions. So that's my take on the virtual end of it. Yeah, thanks, Sam. We have a few more questions for you, actually uh, several questions for you here. Um, person who is anonymous uh, right now just basically was asking earlier on, what is the cost for the technical assistance programs? Um, are there grants to cover any related costs to that? How, how, how does that setup work? Uh, there are no costs to the technical assistance to the municipalities. Uh, the funding goes through the Federal Highway Administration. They give money to PennDOT. PennDOT adds a little bit of money to it. Uh, PSATS administers it and PSATS will or will call me up or one of the other people and say, hey, somebody needs a technical assist uh, in such and such municipality. We go out and there is absolutely no cost to the local government. It's free of charge. I essentially work for PSATS, uh, who essentially does it for PennDOT. Uh, so there is no charge for it. Um, that's why um, I, I spoke earlier about doing most of my work in the rural western part of the state. That's why I, I encourage people because you have a, a changeover of uh, elected supervisors at the local level, and some of them are not familiar with LTAP. I did one. Uh, Actually, I strayed a little bit farther down in the center part of the state, down in Juniata County, and uh, they needed some information down there on posting and bonding, and I went down and went over the program with them. Um, and they said, OK, what do we owe you? Uh, you don't owe me anything. It is free of charge to the municipalities. And uh, myself and everyone else tries to spread that word out there again because of the change over in uh, elected officials or the change over in uh, the roadmasters. Also, uh, can you speak maybe more about the difference uh, based on your perspective, Western Pennsylvania versus Eastern Pennsylvania in the recommended treatments of winter roads? Sure. Um, it, it's Basically, and I'm going to go back to my Winter Maintenance 101 course. Um, I always say, and people people look at me and roll their eyes, but my uh, perspective on winter maintenance, and I actually worked at one time, um, I can give you bare roads anywhere, any place in the state um, at any storm if you give me enough money and if you give me enough resources. And obviously you don't need to do that good of uh, winter maintenance if you're on a gravel road up in Warren County or a, a road in Potter County that has 10, 10 cars a day. So you need to establish the level of service for your community. OK, what can people drive on and get from point A to point B safely? It may in the eastern part of the state where it's more rural and you have a thousand cars on your roadway, you may have to go out and practice anti-icing, uh, practice straight salt out there. Um, and, and even in the rural areas, I'm an I'm a advocate of anti-icing because you're going to save mixes. But uh, you, you establish your level of service. What can your constituents drive on? And of course, you've got uh, school buses out there, even on your rural roads. So you're probably going to use more straight salt in the eastern part of the state. 
and you're going to use more mixes in the western part of the state um, because of the traffic levels out there. Um, I tell a story years ago, I was in one of the, somewhere in one of the Philadelphia suburbs and uh, a lot of the municipalities, at least in the past, based their call outs, they, they let their local police force who was out, you know, 24 hours a day, they would call the public works and say, hey, we think you better come out. And one of the policemen transferred from Somerset County, which is obviously uh, in the winter area, uh, snow belt area, to I believe it was either Chester or Montgomery County, and uh, he was on duty. It started to snow a little bit, and to him, coming from Somerset, it was a flurry. Uh, but there was so much traffic out there, he didn't call the public works out. This was years ago in a timely manner. And all that traffic hit the road and public works had a hard time uh, getting the roads into an acceptable driving condition because of the late call out. So, you know, you base it on your level of service. You base it on what you can afford to meet that level of service and your resources uh, that you have out there. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to give the misconception, though, even if you're in a rural area, you should be looking at all the new technology out there to help you. Um, one of the things that uh, I talk about in my winter maintenance course is I've had people tell me that they can use a mixture that's 25% salt, 75% aniskid, and they're saving salt. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. If they have to go over that road two or three times to get it in acceptable driving condition, then actually they probably would have been better off with a 50-50 mixture and uh, got off that road and gone to another road because after two to three times, they've actually used more salt. So again, it's a learning curve like someone else said, uh, but you got to know your local driving conditions and your local traffic. Um, unfortunately, even in a rural area, we are a very mobile society and you have people working odd shifts. So you got to take that and the buses into consideration um, and get it into uh, the best, safest driving condition you can get. Um, I, I talk, and I'm, I'm one of the people, maybe the only person that does this, I don't talk about snow removal. I talk about traction control because in essence, that's what you're doing. You're trying to get the roadway back into near normal winter driving conditions, and a lot of that's providing traction for the people that got to drive in your locale. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, I also have a comment here for you. It's a thank you that's going out from Carmen Boyd. Carmen is new to a board of supervisors in Valley Township, Chester County. Uh, Carmen plans to be sharing that information with the board of supervisors that was provided here today. Um, we have Dave who is asking, do you have a link to view your winter maintenance course? Not at this point. Um, we will discuss that, like I said, uh, that will be tested tomorrow. And at that point, uh, we will talk about linking it. Um, I'm not sure they may record it like this session's being recorded, or they may provide the PDF format of it. Uh, but I will certainly take that and run with it and talk with the people that employ me at PSATS uh, and tell them I received a question on that and I will have them get the information out statewide and whoever asked the question, uh, we will get the answer out to you. But uh, at this point, I don't have a specific answer. Okay, Sam, uh, also at this point, we do have a few more questions for you, but I would like to uh, advise folks that uh, once we're done going through the questions that have been offered up for Sam here, uh, we will entertain additional questions. And I have a couple out there also for other speakers in our session, you know, from earlier in the session. So if there's anything else you'd like to ask of any of our presenters from this morning's session, please go ahead and enter those questions or comments now in the live event Q&A. But I ask one thing, if you don't mind, please let us know who your question is targeted for since we're combining now the different presenters in this round of questioning. Uh, just let us know by first name or by topic uh, what your question is so that we can direct it properly, okay? Uh, so go ahead if you have any of those questions or comments and enter those in the live event Q&A at this time. Sam, let me pick up uh, if I can in where we left off there. 
Um, some of the some of the questions have to do with scheduling too. One particularly as far as drop ins go. How are the drop ins uh, scheduled? Uh, basically, that is coordinated uh, with PSATs and PennDOT. And at this point, we're doing one drop in per month. Uh, at least that's the last information that I have received. There will be should be one coming up for the month of November since we just did one in October. Um, you you should be a, a member of the L go LTAP and join the LTAP website and the coordination is through emails. Uh, I just saw an email the other day um, on one that's going to be on a traffic safety item. So basically right now they're doing uh, one per month. I don't know if they will expand that. Um, if you feel there's a need for more or if you have a specific topic, I would encourage you to go to the 1-800 for LTAP and give them your uh, suggestions there. Sam, this one also deals with uh, scheduling, but maybe at, at a broader level here, uh, so I'm not sure how it applies, but uh, feel free to comment. Um, how often does LTAP schedule courses and does LTAP schedule classes if a municipality has an interest, you know, just based on one municipality expressing an interest or if a few municipalities get together, express a similar interest and then you know, a course might be set up to benefit, you know, those multiple municipalities. Can you comment? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, we actually go over that a little more uh, in a uh, drop in or a course. Basically, uh, the contract, uh, we we work in a bureaucracy, so the contract PennDOT has with PSATS uh, allows for X amount of maintenance courses and X amount of uh, traffic safety courses off the top of my head. I can't tell you what they are, but there's quite a few. And the same way with tech assists, uh, X amount of maintenance tech assists and X amount of traffic safety tech assists. Uh, basically, we coordinate it uh, obviously through PennDAT and PSATS, but your local planning partners, uh, your CETA COGS in the state college area that I'm familiar with and uh, uh, NEPA up in the northeast part and I'm going brain dead for the southwest part, but whoever you deal with for your local planning partners, uh, your planning commissions, uh, they are very intimately involved in it and they help coordinate the courses and they may, for example, say we want uh, five uh, paving courses in uh, southwest part of the state or we want uh, five, six, seven winter maintenance courses in the southern Allegheny portions out around the Pittsburgh area. Um, the best way to do it again is go to 1-800 for LTAP and tell them there's a need for a course and the minimum number, obviously we don't want to send an instructor out there if we get back into doing it in person for you know five people, so there is a minimum number. Um, it, it's it's 15 sometimes in the rural area they'll drop that down to 12. Uh, as far as a municipality that is called a road show. If you have enough people in your municipality you're large enough uh, that you're in you want your entire public works crew to attend and it's above the 15 threshold we will come right out uh, to your municipality and we will call that a road show. And that'll only be open to your municipality or if you want some of the adjacent municipalities, uh, you can invite them. But it's kind of a uh, controlled uh, class rather than just putting one out in uh, a certain area. You control uh, who gets first dibs on going to that class. I've done a lot of those and like in the city of Pittsburgh, obviously uh, they are large enough. I'm just going to do a road show for the city. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Also, um, as far as build a better mousetrap goes, do you have any information on uh, what the cycle is of that each year when when innovations or ideas are being sought or does that just happen over the course of a year? Uh, again, w once you are into the LTAP system, you will get an email. Uh, I believe, I want to say last year they wanted them submitted by March of the year. I haven't seen anything for 2021. 
Uh, I, I'm sorry that I can't give you specific information on that, but you will get an email uh, from LTAP saying the submissions are due. Uh, when we go out and do the courses or if we do them virtually, when it comes close to the deadlines for the submissions, we will give you a heads up that they're coming. And again, the planning partners will also tell you that, uh, hey, if you got to build a better mousetrap submission, uh, get it in because the deadline is X. So uh, that's basically how we try to get the info out for that. So you get your uh, innovations out there in time. Sam, you mentioned that uh, from time to time you may have encouraged uh, folks at the local government level to submit a particular idea or innovation for consideration and build a better mousetrap. Can you maybe comment on what you see there from your own perspective in terms of how easily overlooked or perhaps not uh, those ideas or innovations might be just based on their own size and scale? Uh, that's I guess the answer to that, um, going back to the different parts of the state, um, in the western part of the state, you may have three elected supervisors that are also uh, the road crew. Uh, they may hesitate a little bit. They're like, oh, well, you know, we do this here. We're not sure anybody else wants to do it. Um, and that's the ones we encourage. And uh, I ran into one in the western part of the state, and again, I'm going brain dead for the specifics, but they were building inlets, um, and they had a unique way of building the inlet, and off the top of my head, I can't tell you what it was. Uh, I believe they were using some sort of pipe system where they were uh, beveling the pipe to help with the inlet, um, and, and they thought, well, let we do it. That doesn't mean anybody else wants to do it. Um, another one that I recall in the past, somebody had a way of getting the leaves out of the ditches uh, on some of the rural areas on their gravel roads, and that to me was a good good idea to submit. So I encourage it. Uh, basically, I guess the answer to the question, it depends on how, fam how familiar and, and how comfortable you feel with sharing your idea and uh, putting all the information together and getting it out there. Thanks, Sam. We're going to give you a little bit of a break here. I have other questions for others now to uh, to go ahead and cycle through. So uh, I'd like to get started on that. But again, the reminder, uh, if you have comments or questions for any of our presenters, now's the time to go ahead and enter those in the live event Q&A. Um, from earlier in the presentation, uh, when we were talking in the first topic on salt brine best practices, um, Dave had uh, offered up a, convert, um, a comment or an observation basically indicating that when spraying the load itself, you know, in the bed, it tends to make mud and plug up in the spinner, you know, in terms of, you know, the preferred methods of application. So would anybody uh, on the salt brine topic like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I can I can offer a comment. Um, first off, you know, the, the desired or the preferred method to apply your salt brine is directly into the auger and the spinner. You know, that is the most efficient and the best way to doing it. So when we were talking about that earlier in that example, the way I took it is if I was a small rural township, I wanted to try a, a load of brine for pre-wetting and I didn't have that capability yet to put it into my auger and spinner like we do at PennDOT. So in that case, you know, we did mention that you could do that. Is, is the comment, it, it makes mud if you do that, that is possible. I have seen that. Uh, typically, it comes down to two things, uh, possibly putting too much brine into it, but more likely it's, it's the quality of the anise skid is where we run into having mud issues. Um, and that's, you know, based on where you're located. Some areas of the state have anise skid that is more of a crushed stone. Others of us are, are not as fortunate and it's more along the line of uh, a real fine sand and that can, um, develop a kind of a clumping mud aspect into the spinner. So that is possible, yes. In a related question uh, also here, are there negative effects then of using too much brine on roads and bridges? Um, I, I'm going to say, you know, with us, we, we control how much we put out. Um, negative effect of pre-wetting, which is what we're talking about today, you can't put that much out. 
You know, we were talking about a gallon a mile, you know, a, a shot glass every 62 feet. You know, that's that's not a large quantity whatsoever. So in, in the pre-wetting aspect of things, um, I don't think you could put out that much to cause any kind of a negative impact. Here's another related one then, very close, uh, very close in terms of how these are all situated here. In your experience then, how important is it to get the batch just right? Or is there a lot of room for variation? There's a little bit of room for variation, and that's why we recommend a, a strict quality control program and, and testing your brine with the correct equipment. And there is a little bit of variation. You know, spot on brine is good down to negative six. And if it, it hits that window, you know, the temperature range that it it can work just fluctuates up a little bit more. You know, you start getting closer to zero and into the plus side where you start getting some bad branches of brine. Um, it can start freezing and causing problems at a much higher temperature, and that's where you got to be careful. So there is a window. Um, it, it isn't, you know, dialed in real, real tight. You do have a window. Um, so, yeah. As far as uh, the testing equipment there, that do you have, Travis asked whether or not you have the name and brand available of the sodium chloride salt brine refractometer. Um, sure, and you could probably Google that and see what is available out there um, to utilize. The one I had a picture of in the example was a, a MISCO handheld refractometer. Uh, that company in particular makes refractometers for just about any application, you know, whether it's salt brine making or or even down to maple syrup and honey. They they have a lot of different stuff out there. It's available. So uh, MISCO is the one that we had in our example, the one I have sitting here um, in front of me at the time. Is that common spelling? MISCO, M-I-S-K-O? C-O. M-I-S-C-O. Thank you very much. Barry Hoffman asks, are environmental groups uh, suing about salt usage at all? Not to my knowledge. And I have another question. It looks like this might be the last question in line right now. Um, speaking of using PennDOT's agility program to exchange salt brine, how readily available are the salt brine mix tanks for a local government to use? And does PennDOT have them at each stockpile or county facility? Can you can you repeat that? Because I'm not quite sure I'm following what they're asking. Yeah, regarding PennDOT's agility program to exchange salt brine services, I guess. How readily available are salt brine mix tanks for a local government to use? Does PennDOT have them at each stockpile or county facility? If they're if the question is referring to how how easily available is salt brine for agility purposes, you know, they would just need to reach out to their local PennDOT office. Most county offices have storage tanks right at majority of their stockpiles. I can't say that they'll have them at everyone but uh, it is pretty easily available to get your hands on in the winter time because we use it so often. And I do have one more question here as far as the agility program goes. I think earlier you'd mentioned that um, you know you had referred folks on to agility coordinators in their area. The question is how is that agility program organized right now as far as the coordinators go? Are there agility coordinators in each district or each county within the respective districts for folks to reach out? How, how is that set up right now? Uh, Ken. Yeah, go ahead. It's Dan, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, there are coordinators in every district. It varies by position. What I will say is for a local government, the best thing to do is it, who you have a best relationship with. If it's the um, municipal service reps in the district office or if you deal with an assistant county manager or the county manager you can work it through any one of those three and they'll get you where you need to be um like i said it varies based on district on on who holds those positions but typically your county managers your assistant county managers and uh your um, municipal service reps they're plugged in to get you where you need to go thanks dan appreciate that Danielle, that's all the questions I have if you'd like to take it from here.
Thanks, Ken. Um, thanks to Sam and all of our speakers. Um, we still have about nine minutes left on the session. So um, if you do have additional questions for any of our speakers, again, enter them into the chat pod. A lot of great questions coming in today from our audience, a lot of great uh, discussion. Um, so definitely appreciate um, our presenters and then of course all of the questions that are coming in. I just like to remind you that a recording of this session will be available on our event website uh, within the next week or so. Also, uh, you can click on the participant link in the calendar invitation you receive for today's session um, and you'll be able to listen to a playback of, of the full uh, session. Also, I uh, want to mention again our virtual exhibit hall, um, which is available 24-7 on our event website, www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. There actually are a lot of winter services, innovations, and best practices on display as part of this virtual exhibit hall. Um, for example, uh, we have one about a living snow fence, a pre-winter checklist, a spreader cart, uh, also a gravity feed brine spreader. So there are a lot of great innovations and smart practices that we might not have been able to talk to as part of today's presentation, but are on display as part of that virtual exhibit hall. So certainly encourage you to check out uh, that exhibit hall. Again, there's a contact form out there. So if you do have questions about a particular innovation that you're seeing, I invite you to submit that question via the contact form and we'll get you connected to the subject matter expert. So Ken, I'll just go back to you real quick just to see if we have any more questions that have come in via the chat pod. Nothing at this time, Danielle. I actually do have a quick question for Sam. Uh, Sam, you mentioned the salt and snow management course, and I know that course has been offered um, through LTAP now for probably about the last five years or so. So, I, and I know you're working on this winter maintenance 101 virtual uh, session, but for, from those local governments who have taken the salt and snow management course, what sort of feedback have you received from them in terms of preparing them for winter operations? Well, uh actually we've got some really good feedback especially somebody mentioned it earlier uh some of the new operators that have not plowed snow uh and treated roads in the in the past uh they probably provide the most positive comments because we go out you know we give them the basics and talk about the what ifs um we have seen an increase uh, since we've been giving that course, an increase in uh, the people that are making their own brine, uh, buying their own brine makers, which uh, they can use liquid fuels money for. And we have seen a drastic increase in the amount of trucks that are being set up for pre-wedding. Um, and, and again, the, the reason is that is uh, we're seeing an increased level of service out there uh, based on the, the techniques and the information we're providing in that course uh, and a cost savings because we're saving material. And in some of the uh, more urban areas, uh, we're, we're seeing not only that, but we're seeing an impact on the environment. Uh, they're using less material. There's less material to clean up. There's less of a chance there's going to be any stormwater runoff. So uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback which is good, uh, but what's even better is we're seeing a lot of the innovations, a lot of the new technology, technology put into practice. Great, thank you, Sam. Uh, Ken, I'll turn it over to you real quick, just in case we have additional questions in the chat pod. Uh, there is one particular person or two who may have problems, uh, you know, hearing the video uh, and one who was mentioning that audio may have gone out uh, recurrently here and there. So I'm not sure if that was probably more to do with their connection, Danielle, on their side. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ken. Um, and we certainly we've had a few technological issues here on today's session. We certainly do apologize, um, you know, sometimes with certain connectivity issues. Um, so we certainly do apologize that you were unable to hear um, Deputy Secretary Larry Shiflett at the beginning. Uh, however, what we are going to do for the recordings that we're going to make available on the event website is we're going to incorporate his video message in with the recording um, so that you'll be able to play um, play that recording back and, and hear his message. So again, I do apologize for the, the technological issues on today's session. 
Um, you know, certainly, you know, with technology, you never know what will happen, but thank you for, for staying with us. Um, we do thank you again to, to all of our presenters. Uh, they all are very busy. Uh, so we certainly appreciate them taking time out of their schedules uh, to present as part of today's session. And of course, we thank you to our audience members for, for participating. Again, a lot of great dialogue, a lot of great questions. Um, so at, at this juncture, uh, seeing that there are uh, no more questions in the chat pod, uh, we're going to go ahead and conclude today's session. Um, and again, just a reminder, uh, check out our event website, www.pendot.gov uh, forward slash innovations week uh, for our virtual exhibit hall. And then within the next week or so, a recording of this session and all the sessions that are being held as part of the virtual innovation week will be available on that event website. So with that said, I wish you all a wonderful day and uh, everyone take care. And Danielle, before you end the session, we do have a late arrival question here about whether PDHs will be issued for this class. I know that they are being provided. Do you want to maybe uh, offer some insight in terms of how that'll be done? Yes, thank you, Ken. That's a great question. Yes, PDH credits will be available for all of our sessions as part of Virtual Innovation Week. Um, next week, all of our participants will be receiving um, an event feedback survey. Uh, so once you, you take the event feedback survey, there will be another link uh, for you to self-certify that you were in fact on today's session and then we'll be working with uh, PennDOT Highway Administration's training area uh, to issue those PDH credits in the coming weeks. So yes, PDH credits are available. So just please be on the lookout for that, um, that email that will be coming out from our DOT innovations uh, at pa.gov email uh, account. Uh, that will be coming out next week. Uh, so again, uh, there's an event feedback survey and then another one at the end of that survey to self-certify for the PDH credits. Thanks, Ken. Certainly. Any more questions before we end the session? Okay, great. Thanks again, everyone, for attending and again, have a great day.